My name's Kent Williams. I'm 61 years old, been keeping bees somewhere around 35 years, give or take. I, I forgot, really. number of colonies that we have varies from 400 to 900 per year. We have bees in uh, Kentucky. That's our base. And we also have bees in Mississippi. And we ship bees to California to pollinate almonds. And uh, we pollinate other crops in West Kentucky as well. Plus, we make honey crops, sell honey. And my name's Gordon Samples. I'm from 68 and from Clinton, Kentucky. Uh, I started keeping bees to help my dad uh, probably when he was 90 or 91. My dad started, the best I can figure, in 1934. He was 12 years old. Back then, you basically caught swarms and put them in hives, and they took care of themselves. There wasn't many diseases, wasn't much else. And one time, during the time he was in high school, they needed a pond for the cows, and they didn't have the money, but he did uh, from selling honey. I can remember still having them when I went to college, and I came home spring break, and we were cleaning a fence row around the hives, and he kept chopping, and the bees got active. It was in March, and I said, those bees are going to get after us. He said, no, they won't bother us. Well, they didn't bother him. <laughs> I got stung eight times <clears throat> and was running, getting ready to jump in the pond when, uh, when it finally got away from them. One of the things that I have learned at this, uh, my emphasis was on raising honey, uh, producing honey and until here and I realized what I need to do is produce bees and let the bees take care of the honey. I'm I'm trying to grow as much stuff on the farm to where the bees have a, have something to eat without leaving going somewhere else. Because when they go somewhere else the increased chance of pesticides and chemicals and other things. So you can learn more about what uh, what what's out here around us from bees than about anything else. And uh, and the honey's good, too. <laughs> we had a uh, small farm, still have a small farm, and we were transitioning, uh, not willingly, out of raising tobacco and hogs and, and a typical grain farm in West Kentucky uh, into what was coming next. And uh, we needed something that would provide an income on a small acres, 200 acres, that would uh, keep a family going. So we decided to raise produce, and we raised produce, had about 10 acres of produce every year for a few years. And one of the things we raised was yellow squash, summer squash, and it required an insect pollinator. And uh, I'd had a little experience with bees with my grandfather. He didn't keep bees, but he robbed bee trees. So I, I wasn't... I wasn't intimidated by bees, plus I was uh, coming out of a lifestyle that uh, uh, kept me well supplied with adrenaline, and uh, <laughs> I missed that. And the bees, I found out that not only did they pollinate the squash, they also fed my addiction to adrenaline. Good morning. My name's uh, Wes Woodcock. I lived down here in Wingo, Kentucky. When I was retired, the wife bought me uh, two beehives for Christmas, of all crazy things. But uh, we joined a local bee club there and got schooled up somewhat on it and uh, did pretty good. And I expanded my hives there. Oh, I think I had up to 10 there at one time. Living here in Wingo, uh, we met uh, Kent Williams and uh, He's a master beekeeper here in Kentucky and a uh, fantastic uh, mentor, uh, teacher. I've gone from two hives to uh, well, over 60, uh, trying to do different things, and, uh, working on pollination contracts. And you know, a lot of people believe the queen uh, uh, controls the hive. Well, she really doesn't. It's all the workers, because they're out day to day, if you will. Uh, assessing environments and you know the availability of pollen and nectar and uh, 
other things like that. So uh, they they pretty much tell her how how and when to lay eggs or how much and uh, and I really find it I call it fascinating to watch uh, the bees work and and do their thing. Um, it, it's also very calming when you really watch them and, and they're just intensely in, involved in what they're doing. It's, a, it's To me, it's just crazy. I started out with one hive in the spring. By the end of the year, I had three hives that first year. And we found out that um, people would come to the house to buy sweet corn and tomatoes. They drive 15 miles from town to buy sweet corn, tomatoes, and okra. Uh, the other things we had to take somewhere to sell because you have to chase people down to sell squash to them. And uh, <laughs> so uh, we found out that they would drive to the house to buy honey too. And not only were they driving to the house to buy produce and just buy the honey while they were there, they were driving specifically to buy the honey. So we decided that it would probably be a good plan to have more bees because we had a pretty good honey market that was developing. So the second year we had 17 hives, went from 3 to 17. And the third year we had 51 hives. And the fourth year we had 208 hives. And uh, the fifth year we had 100, 120, 140 hives because we got American fowl brood. And all of a sudden I realized that um, there's more to this than just setting bees out there. And uh, taking the honey off of them that if you're going to do this and make money at it, you've got to learn how to, how to know what's going wrong and how to fix it if there's a, if there's a fix to it. And uh, that, that's when I actually began to be a beekeeper instead of just a bee haver. Hi, I'm Annie Broyles from Paducah, Kentucky. My husband wished for bees and to the point that I said, be quiet. And that was on Memorial Day in 94. And I taught school and I went back to school on Tuesday and there was a swarm by my classroom door. So I called him and said, you wished, you got, come and get them. I took my dad's um, pith helmet, which was orange. My daughter had a pink formal. I took the net off of it and put that around the pith helmet with duct tape and some elastic, and he wore that for two or three years. It worked. And then somebody called us and said, I've got a hive body in the back of my, in my yard, and there's a swarm in it. Come get it if you want it. Well, that was two then. Well, they did good. And somebody says, oh, you can split them. So we had four. And before you know it, we had a hundred. I started making lip balm. And he says, nobody will buy that stuff. So I made it and labeled it. And it sold. So I made some cream. And he said, nobody will buy that. He kept telling me, nobody will buy that. So anyway, I got to where I had I'd seven or eight things that I made from wax. And then the son-in-law came, and he said, would you want to start a bee supply house? And I said, yesterday. And so that's why we have the bee barn. One, one of the people that I learned from, uh, I eventually, and still, still, still do, consult for him. Because uh, in the beginning, he taught me, and then I went to another level, and he, he went in a different direction. And he's, uh, <laughs> he's a millionaire now. And uh, his wife jokes that, uh, that I made him a millionaire because of the consultation. And stuff that, and he 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 would listen to me when he wouldn't listen to his wife. Basically, is what it amounted to. Hello, I'm Ray Bruce. I'm from Jukedom, Tennessee. My grandfather was a beekeeper. He passed away in 1954, and I was nine years old. When I came back in bees, I had a whole bunch to learn. 
the bees would uh, have diseases. They had bugs that bugged the bugs. And, well, we've got treats for the diseases. We've got to take measure to keep the bug from bugging the bug so much. One thing about beekeeping, we can guarantee two things. You will get stung, and bees will die. Those are no way around it. Anybody that's interested in keeping bees, the best advice I'd get to them, give to them, when you think you're interested in keeping bees, join the local bee club at least a year before you want to get bees. Uh, learn something about what you need to do. When I first got the bees back into beekeeping, why, my first quart of honey cost me $600. Father's given the school here today, uh, uh, lost 300 hives this winter uh, from a new disease. He didn't know how he had it, what killed his bees. He had to go to people that had uh, the technology and had done research and uh, talked to several of those before he found out what had killed his bees. But then he had to send the bees to the lab to find out what the disease was and sort of what to do for it. But... Uh, he has no intention to keep quitting bees, and uh, I don't either. <laughs> I attach myself to uh, some commercial beekeepers that I learned an enormous amount from. I learned how to stay in business keeping bees, and how to stay in business is you've got to learn how to take one hive and turn it into five. Because if you can do that, you can you can sustain an eighty percent loss every year and keep your numbers up. Some years we've had an eighty percent loss. Most years we don't. Most years our losses are somewhere between five and fifteen percent. Some years they're a lot more than that. But uh, I I worked with these guys and learned learned how to do it and learned how to raise queens and learned uh, learned the business pretty much. I'm Chuck Collins, and I live in Paducah, Kentucky, but I was born and raised there. My wife and I have lived all over the country, but we came back here when we lost her father, Richard, uh, in 2011, and uh, so 10 years ago we lost him. And, and um, he was my inspiration for uh, keeping bees. He started keeping bees when he retired from uh, Sherwin-Williams, um, and, um, and he displayed so much energy and passion for it that... that uh, that was really contagious, and and when we would travel back here for our uh, for our family vacations, we would uh, we would help him with his bees, and um, uh, but I remember conversations with him all over the phone, uh, where he was so excited about uh, going to Canada uh, with uh, with Kent Williams and Kent and Kent and my father-in-law were big pals. I keep about fifty hives now, uh, um, a roundabout number, uh, and uh, but we also own a, a beekeeping store from from here in Western Kentucky. Uh, if someone wants to learn how to keep bees, there, there's as many bee clubs as there is weeks in a, in, a, in the month. And every week you could go to a bee, beekeeper's meeting uh, and drive less than an hour. Uh, there's people that come to those meetings that want to learn, and there's people that come that want to share. And, and uh, the marriage is, is, is mutual. It, 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 it works. I, I've taken every opportunity in my, in my first year's keeping bees uh, to spend as much time with Kent Williams as I could. And that, that's traveling with him to, to work bees in Mississippi. We moved bees in Mississippi, split bees in Mississippi. Just a, 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 a few hour car ride with him it can, can share so much information with, uh, uh, with you. It's, it's, it's pretty incredible. So, uh, But it's not hard to get the guy talking, that's for sure. So. Businesses are not about trading dollars for products. Businesses are about the relationship you develop between vendors and producers. And and that's uh, that's something that's became really apparent to me over the years is that it's all about business relationships. And if you can keep healthy business relationships, you don't really have to worry if you need something. All you all you got to do is pick up the phone. And they're the same way. I mean, um, it's a community in in the commercial beekeeping world. It's a community. I'm Bob Moore, and uh, I. 
I, I teach uh, honeybee biology and beekeeping at Austin Peay State University. And today, I've got about 30 students up here. The purpose is to inform them about the pollination benefits of, of bees to the human. A developed country like the United States, about 35% of our food supply is dependent on pollination. 2008 until 2011, I worked in Central Asia. So I was developing, reestablishing agriculture in areas that had been torn up by the Russian invasion. Big aid projects went in and they would plant maybe a thousand acres of fruit trees, and particularly they would plant apple trees, but they would plant the same variety of apple trees. Well, to a uh, person familiar with growing fruit trees, you have to have a different variety of, of apple tree. So even a crab apple tree will pollinate a, an apple, a regular uh, Fuji apple, for instance. But if you have a thousand acres or a thousand hectares, of Fuji apples and not a single uh, apple tree of another variety, it won't produce any apples, okay. even though you have pollination. We lost over 300 hives this last fall. And one of the guys that, that helps me, um, <laughs> he was pretty depressed about it, and he couldn't understand why it wasn't bothering me. I said, hey, we don't need them right now. He said, well, what, we're not going to have those to go to almonds. And I said, that doesn't matter. We'll make the money some, some other way. So, you know, we, there's always a plan B and a plan C and a plan D. And sometimes you might get halfway through the alphabet before something clicks. This year, we didn't make anything pollinating almonds. But we bought two loads of bees coming back out of almonds I knew that if we lost that many bees, everybody else was losing bees too, and they were. We bought two loads of bees coming back out of almonds, gave uh, $180 or $185 per hive, a double deep hive, uh, broke those down into four nukes per hive, sold those for $145, double the money. So we recovered what we would have made in almonds just by doing that. All right, my name is Robert Godfrey. I live in, in, in Macon, Georgia, and I've been keeping bees for over 40, 40 something years now. In Jamaica, is, the world is more, the climate is more warmer, so we could raise bees all year. Here is different, the, the bees die in the winter time. In Canada, I listened to, to his speech, and I took a liking of him, and then I learned from him how to keep bees in the winter. That's one of my main thing, reasons I'm here. Only on the winter, winter bees in the winter time. I have several people that work with me that I've helped get to the the level that that we all are, and uh, they're all younger than me, which means that they're uh, more energetic and more ambitious than I am, and they uh, they pay attention to business models that that we uh, that we use and they've done extremely well with it and this was a great year for them it's a bad year losing 300 highs but it was a great year for them to learn that you, just because plan a don't work that doesn't mean you'll make more money off of plan b you might hey my name is chris noss i live in barlow kentucky and I've been keeping bees for 10, 11 years now. And the reason that I got started on keeping bees was my wife thought she had arthritis in her knee. It was really bothering her bad. I have heard of bee sting therapy in the past. Supposedly, the venom from a bee sting will help ease arthritis. So a lot of people will actually pay beekeepers to, you know, to have bees sting the area that uh, is of, of concern. So she looked it up and she said, this sounds kind of crazy. And I said, well, you know, if you want to try it, we'll call call my buddy Danny and have him bring a, a box of bees out here. So I would kind of get them in a jar, set them in the refrigerator where they kind of slow down a little bit. And then I would get a pair of tweezers and get, the, get them by the wings. And then I'd start rubbing that bee on her knee 
till eventually it would sting her. <clears throat> well, we went through this for, oh, I don't know, two or three, four weeks maybe, and it wasn't doing any good. So she said, no more bee stings. Well, in the meantime, she set up a doctor's appointment and come to find out she had a torn meniscus in her knee. Uh, as far as the bee sting therapy, I don't know. I've got quite a bit of arthritis in my hands, and I get my hands stung occasionally because I work without gloves. I don't know whether it works or not. I don't know how bad my arthritis would be if I didn't get the bee sting. I know that some, some places I go speak, uh, they, they look at me like I've got the answer that's going to make everybody rich. I'm not sure I even had that much to do with making the one guy rich. He had to do it, you know. Al Krim, Droplos, Illinois. I've been a beekeeper for over 18 years, and dowsing has been around six, six or seven years. Dowsing is a way of finding water, so I started developing a pattern of finding these lines and seeing where bees in natural life live. So as I start studying it more, I start finding out that these bees live on certain areas and they can produce a certain amount of feed and uh, be able to maintain their health. Bees have a certain frequency, which is about 250, 290. They're extremely sensitive to vibration. Matter of fact, you can go anywhere where a beehive naturally is and you can find three things. There's a water veins, there's called a carry line running through it. And there's also a Hartman line running through it. And so you find those spots with your dowsing rods, put your beehives there, and it usually runs, you can get about 22 to three times more honey. I don't use any treatment inside the beehives. And you can almost count the number of like viral mites or hive beetles that you have in your hive. And I never have had any problems. But my hives are not lined out in a traditional way. They're spotted on certain spots because certain spots vibrate at a different uh, frequency. If everybody would look at that first before they get bees, whether you can actually have a spot for them, it would save a lot of bees. Um, I tell the truth, even if it hurts. You know, uh, I don't like to tell people that I lost 300 hives this last year. When I, when I hear myself say that, I'm, I'm hearing failure, but uh, hey, it happened. That's the truth. And uh, if I don't tell people that I lost 300 highs, when they lose three out of their six highs, they're going to think they're a failure. But if they know that I did, maybe they'll think, well, he lost them and he's not, he's not crying about it. It's not that I enjoyed it. It's that it happened. The key is, understanding why you lost them and fixing it or doing what you can to mitigate the losses. My name is Rick Lamar. I've been beekeeping for about uh, six years, seven, six or seven years. Um, and I got started into it uh, because uh, my wife had uh, diabetes and, and couldn't eat sugar. I'd heard horror stories about substitute sugars, you know, artificial sweeteners. So we looked at natural uh, sweeteners as much as we could, and, and honey was at the top of the list. Uh, the only problem was my wife was allergic to honey. And I got to doing some research, and, and I found out that uh, processed honey that, that had been filtered quite heavily or homogenized, or, uh, that some people did have an allergic reaction to it. Uh, but that uh, those same people could eat raw honey, unfiltered raw honey, and, uh, and, and not have a reaction to it. So we started buying honey, uh, raw local honey. And of course it got kind of expensive because we used quite a bit of it. So I said, well, I said, uh, you know, the grocery budget's pretty high to begin with. I said, maybe I should start keeping some bees and harvest my own honey. So I did. Uh, that's how I got. That's how I got into it. Uh, it's a really fascinating business to be in. First, because you're working with honeybees and they're a fascinating creature. And second, because that uh, you're working with uh, humans and they're a fascinating creature. <laughs>